In the shadow of the cross, Jesus told Peter that Satan desired to have him. We see this recorded in Luke chapter 22, in verses 31 and 32. That the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. <clears throat> Obviously, when, <clears throat> when Jesus stated this, Satan did not have Peter at that time. But he wanted him. Jesus was concerned about Peter. Concerned enough to pray for him. Concerned enough to pray for him by name. And concerned enough to pray for him that his faith would fail not. And then he encouraged Peter that when he was converted, to strengthen the brethren. There are a lot of valuable lessons that we can learn from this very short uh, passage that are important for us to learn. The f very first thing is that if Satan doesn't have us, he wants us. He has a desire for us. Those individuals who are in the world, Satan already has them. Uh, Jesus told the Pharisees of his day that ye are of your father, the devil. The lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh, he speak, or when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of himself or of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So here is Jesus saying, "You individuals, you're already of the devil. He's your father from a spiritual standpoint, not God. Of course, they had a claim that they were the children of God." But Jesus says, you're really children of the devil. He's your spiritual father. Not everyone who claims to be of God, thus we learn, is of God. And there's another great lesson that we could learn from that passage. But here, those individuals, Satan already had them. Now then... Obviously, he wants to keep those individuals that he already has. He doesn't want to, in that sense, lose any. But what about those who he does not have? Well, obviously, there's the point that should interest all of us because Satan has a desire to get those who are already saved. Peter was a disciple of the Lord. Satan had the desire for him. Those individuals that are truly children of God, Satan has a desire to get them. They are the ones who are the targets of the fiery darts of the wicked one. You remember in uh, Ephesians 6 chapter, starting in verse 10, that finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And above all, taking the shield of faith, which, um, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. 
Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spear, which is the word of God. Notice we're to stand against Satan and all of his wiles, all of the methods, all of the ways in which he will attempt to attack us. We are described here as a soldier, and we are putting on our armor, going into battle against Satan. And Satan is well trained, he is is well able to go into battle with us. And he's seeking to destroy us. And so we have to put on that whole armor of God so we can stand against him. But he is desiring of us. He's ready to go into battle against us. And when it says there in verse 16, to take the shield of faith wherewith we shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. In other words, he's going to be shooting arrows at us, those darts that will destroy the soul. Why? Because he wants, he wants us. He does not want us to be faithful to God and live the godly life. And so those individuals he doesn't have, he wants them. Now the people in the world he already has and he's going to try and make sure everything that he can to keep them. But those who are Christians, those who are faithful to God, he wants them. And he wants to destroy them. We see that in 1 Peter 5 and verse 8. When Peter tells us to be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. person in the world, he's already devoured that individual. He has him. He's destroyed him from a spiritual standpoint. That wants to keep him, yes, and make sure that he doesn't obey the, the truth. But he has that individual. But he's still going around constantly trying to destroy those who are righteous. And thus, our admonition, be sober, be vigilant. word sober means sober-mindedness. It doesn't mean free of alcohol. It would include that. But here is someone who can think and reason correctly, uses their mind in opposition to God. He's sober-minded. He's seriously thinking about eternity and the things about eternity and the value of the soul and where his soul is going to be spending eternity. He has that on his mind. He's thinking reasonably concerning those matters. And then be vigilant, that is, be watchful. We're to watch, yes. Why? Because of who he, of our opposition, Satan, and the ability that he has, the desire that he has. He has a desire to devour us. And so we have to be sober and we have to be vigilant. We have to be constantly on our guard. Lest, as Paul would write in 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 11, lest Satan should get an advantage over us or of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. But the sad point is that a lot of brethren are ignorant of Satan's devices. They don't study God's Word. They don't go back into the Old Testament. In fact, uh, some want to do away with the Old Testament if they could. Don't study it. Don't consider it. And so we don't learn the lessons of history. We don't see how Satan works. We don't see how he can get an advantage over us. And so we fall to his wiles that he uses. Christian is to be wise concerning the devices, the methods that Satan is going to use, and that's going to take some self-examination as well. I have to know myself. You have to know yourself. 
so that we can know how Satan is going to attack. That means we have to know our strengths. We have to know our weaknesses. And Satan's not just going to attack the weaknesses. Oh, a lot of times in a good soldier in soldiering, the leaders will say, we will feign an attack here where there's a strong aspect and then come around and attack this area where there's a weakness. So they'll make it appear the attack is going one way. If you remember the attack on Normandy, that's what they did. Prior to that attack, they sent ideas and thoughts to make it appear as if they're going to attack over here. And then they came in over here. That's what Satan's going to do as well. So we have to know our strengths, we have to know our weaknesses, so that we can be prepared for those attacks. Otherwise, he will get an advantage of us. We have to take heed to the admonitions that God has given. Paul would write in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. Here is an individual who thinks he can stand. Some have stated this as think he, he can stand on his own. On his own power and on his own strength. His own wisdom. As opposed to the wisdom of God. And using God's armor that he has provided for us. And relying upon God and his wisdom. So we think we can stand on our own. And that individual is going to fall. There is that real possibility, though, of us as Christians falling away. Hebrews 12 and, or 3 and verse 12 says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be any, in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. This idea that the denominations have presented for years that you can't sow sin as to be lost. Yet here are individuals that Paul is saying you need to take heed. And they're not just individuals, they're brothers in Christ. Lest, he says, you as a brother in Christ develop an evil heart of unbelief. If you cannot sow sin as to be eternally lost, then you're going to have the possibility of individuals who do not believe in heaven. That's the only conclusion you can draw from this. It is a possibility that here is one who is a faithful soldier of, the, of Christ. And yet through time and through events that take place, he now has an evil heart of unbelief. Now, that's what was taking place in the first century with these, and the reason Hebrews was written. Here's these Jews, these Hebrew brethren, become Christian, but now then because of persecution and because of the events of that time, they were departing Christ and going back into Judaism. Possibility of apostatizing. And he says you have if you don't take heed, there's going to be an evil heart of unbelief. You're going to depart from the living God. That's the same possibility with all of us. We have that possibility of departing from the living God. And thus, we are given the admonition, as Peter was, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. Jesus tells him the spirit is indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak in Matthew 26 and verse 41. And if you notice the context overall as to what takes place, Jesus leaves and he departs for a while to pray, and there they are sleeping again. Now, they had been sleeping. Jesus wakes them up, tells them, Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. They fall asleep again. He goes off and prays, and then the 
mob comes to arrest Jesus. And Peter, the same one that Jesus has already told him, the devil wants you, that he may sift you as wheat. Now then he's told, watch and pray that you don't enter into temptation. And he's asleep. And after the arrest, he follows Jesus far off. And what happens a little bit later than that? He is found denying our Lord. Why? Because he did not watch and pray. He entered into temptation. As Paul ends the, letter, the first epistle to the Corinthians, chapter 16 and verse 13, he gives them actually five admonitions, but verse 14, or 13 has four of them. To watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit ye like men, be strong. There's four, and every one of those is a military term. I wonder how many times we can read the Scriptures and we fail to observe all of the military type of admonitions that are given unto us. Every one of these four terms that are found here in reference to the Corinthians has its background in a military background and basis. We are at war. We're at war with Satan. He has that desire for us. And so that first admonition that he gives, watch ye, you need to be watching. And then stand fast in the faith. Quit ye like men, that's act like men. Be manly, be strong. But we've got to watch. We've got to be on guard. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 6, Paul would say, Therefore let us not sleep, as do others, but let us watch and be sober. There's that idea of sober-mindedness again. Thinking correctly concerning spiritual matters. But before that, watch. Don't sleep. Now, he's not talking about physical sleep there. He's talking about those who are dull in their senses. Those who are not paying attention. Have you ever done something and you weren't really paying attention to it? And then you wonder what you did? If you've lived any, long, any time, uh, you've all experienced that, haven't you? Did I do that? Uh, well, yes, I, I did, didn't I? What, we weren't paying attention. We were asleep through it. Well, that's what Paul is expressing. Here's brethren, here's people who are sleeping through their life, their, through Christianity. Don't sleep as do others, but be, let us watch. Pay attention. Consider what is taking place, what is happening. And then think reasonably, soberly about it. Be serious-minded. To the young preacher in uh, St. Timothy, the fourth chapter, after he tells him to preach the Word in verse 2, and why in verse 3 and 4, he then tells him, Verse 5, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. And while, yes, that was the young preacher Timothy that he's giving this instruction, yet isn't the same principle applicable to all of us? To watch in all things? And yes, endure afflictions, because afflictions will come. Going back to the book of Hebrews, the very purpose for that it was written is, here's these Jews who are leaving Christianity. Why? Because of the persecutions that they were enduring as a Christian. 
So yes, there's going to be afflictions. There's going to be persecutions. Endure those things. And that idea of endurance, you continue on no matter what might come. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. We need to be watchful. Because Satan, if he does not have us, he wants us. And he wants to devour us and destroy us. And if we're not watchful, knowing the devices, the methods that Satan will use, we are grand subjects to be destroyed by him. But also, we learn that Satan wants us for his purposes. Within our life, we're either accomplishing God's purposes or Satan's purposes. Jesus would express it in this manner. He that is not with me is against me. He that gathereth not... With me scattereth abroad, Matthew 12 and verse 30. One or the other, it's either with me or against me. There is no neutral ground. There is no middle wall there in which we can stand upon the middle ground and be friends with both sides. You're either for God, you're either gathering with Christ, or you're against Him, you're scattering abroad. You're either accomplishing God's purposes, or you're accomplishing Satan's purposes. In Matthew, the sixth chapter, in verse 24, Jesus would state that no man can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and mammon. A dual type of person is unstable in all of his ways, James would say. A dual-minded or two-minded man, James 1 and verse 8. He's not really for one and, or the other. He's trying to be both. And Jesus is saying, you cannot be both. You're one or the other. There is a duality that's there that will always exist, either for God or for Satan. As James and John tried to prevent a man who was working miracles in the name of Christ, that is, by his authority, he was authorized by God in doing what he was doing. Here, And here's James and John trying to prevent him. And Jesus says unto them in Luke 9 and verse 50, To forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. So here's these individuals, even though James and John did not know who they were, did not recognize them as being on God's side, yet they knew that he was because he was doing miracles in the name of Christ. And they're trying to forbid him. And Jesus says, don't forbid him. Why? Why not? He's not a part of us. Oh, but he is, Jesus says. The one who's not for us is against us, and the one who's not against us is for us. There's two sides to this, and only two sides... And the fact that he was working miracles in the name of Christ shows that he was on Christ's side. So don't forbid him. But notice, Jesus is recognizing there's only two sides. You're either for Christ or you're against him. Now while James and John didn't recognize this man as being on Christ's side, yet Christ did. And so don't forbid him. Why? Because he's on our side. The only other side was Satan's. And he was against, standing against Satan. But when we sin, 
What's happening to us? We're coming under the bondage of Satan. In John the 8th chapter, in verse 34, Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Word servant there, some of the later translations use the word bondservant. It's literally dealing with someone who is a slave. Here is someone who is a slave of sin. Who is it? The one who commits sin. He's a slave of sin and thus a slave of Satan. As opposed to being of God and being a servant of God. In Romans the 6th chapter. As you enter that chapter, Paul in the seventh chapter has been dealing with the fact that uh, the power of Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the power of God, Romans 1.16, is able to make us and does make us free from the law. That's chapter 7. In chapter 6, he's showing that We've been made free from sin. And he does this by starting out, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin? See, there's the individual who's in Christ. Christ makes us free from that being dead in sin, under the slavery of sin. And we're not to continue thus in that, saying, well, grace will abound this way. That's why some of them argued, and apparently in Rome, that some were saying, well, we just need to sin more and more and more and more, because that way grace will abound more and more. And Paul is saying, absolutely not. And he reminds them of their baptism, verses 3 and 4, and what that baptism does. He's not telling them how to be saved. As sometimes we read that, a lot of times it's telling someone how to be saved. No, that wasn't the purpose of it. Now, it does tell us that. That's not the purpose of it. The purpose was to remind these Romans, here's what happened in your baptism. It's something we need to be reminded of at times. What is it? You died in, that old, in baptism. You're buried with him by baptism. Then you were raised up out of that watery grave of baptism to walk in newness of life. What is it? You're no longer the servants of sin. You've been made free from that sin. No longer a slave of Satan. What is it? You're now a servant of God. Let's skip down to verse 16. He says, Know ye not, that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey. Whether of, now notice the two sides, of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. There's only the two positions. You're either the servant of sin, or you're the servant of righteousness. Either you're obeying sin and the end result of that is death or you're being a servant of righteousness. You're obeying what God says and you're either on Satan's side or you're on God's side. Thus, Satan wants us to accomplish his purposes, to be his slave, to promote his cause instead of the cause of Christ. All of those who are in the religious world, all of the denominations that exist, all of the religions of this world except for the Lord's church, the church of Christ, is on Satan's side. They are pawns of Satan. 
they are bringing people to eternal damnation instead of eternal salvation. The church is the only organization that is bringing people to Christ, who is on Christ's side. Remember, here's what we began with in John the 8th chapter. Here's these individuals that Jesus was speaking to. They were the Pharisees. And he says, you religious people, you're of your father, the devil. Matthew, the sixth chapter, as Jesus presents the judgment, he says, many will say to me at that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name done many wonderful works? And he will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. They're workers of Satan, not workers of God. They claimed an allegiance to God, but in reality they were workers of Satan. Now why? He says, because you did not do the will of my Father which is in heaven. You see, they were in reality the servants of sin, the servants of Satan. They were slaves to him because they were not doing the will of God. And thus they were not servants of God. They were servants of Satan. And Satan is going to use all of the pawns that he has, all of his slaves, all of his servants, to accomplish his purpose in trying to destroy the church and those who are faithful members of the church. And so we need to watch, be on guard, because we need to know his devices. We can know Satan's devices if we but will. And thus we can stand on guard and fight and enter into that war, that battle with him, so that we can be saved. We can stand against the wiles of the devil. But to take that stand, one must obedient submit himself to what God says in becoming a Christian and then in living the Christian life. If you've not become a Christian. Now, what we said in Romans the 6th chapter, Paul was writing to remind them and show them of what their, what their baptism did. But it was that act of baptism that placed them into Christ, he says there in verse 3. And in Christ is where salvation is, St. Timothy 2 and verse 1 and verse 10. So if you haven't been baptized, that baptism must be based upon one's faith, their repentance from their sin, making a confession of their faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, and then, yes, being immersed in water for the forgiveness of their sins. We become a Christian. We're raised up out of that watery grave of baptism, uh, Romans 6 and verse 4, to walk in newness of life, standing against the wiles of the devil and humbly submitting ourselves to the authority of Christ within our life and all that we do and all that we say and all that we think. And so as one who is a Christian, if you have not continued to stand against the walls of the devil, but you've allowed Satan to come in and take over your life once again, then you need to repent and come back into God, be restored to faithfulness to Him, so that you can have that eternal home with God in heaven. If you need to come this morning, we would encourage you to do so as we stand and sing the invitation song.